So let's go ahead and get started. I'll bring up uh, Evan Bergstrom, who does also work here. And he's going to talk about uh, React and GraphQL at NerdWallet. Thanks, Tori. Let me just unlock my machine. So shout out first to Satoko. I've never seen you outside of a button up shirt before. So getting you into a nerd wallet shirt is kind of impressive. And even though I just met you, I don't love to hate you, Devin. You seem like a very lovable person. So yeah. So uh, I'm here to talk about back ends for front ends and how uh, GraphQL is getting worked in here at NerdWallet. Um, the talk really is about the intersection of front end and back end engineering. Uh, based on my experiences over my career and the past three years that I've been here at NerdWallet. Uh, specifically where GraphQL fits at NerdWallet, where I think it fits at NerdWallet, and how we're beginning to leverage it. Uh, I hope that you take two things away from this talk. One is uh, a better understanding of the engineering challenges that motivated the creation of GraphQL so that it can help you all build a better picture of where GraphQL might fit in the projects that you're currently working on, uh, assuming that you're not currently working with it at all. Uh, and then the second thing is some of the challenges that you'll face when you do start to adopt, adopt GraphQL, because it actually changes the paradigm a little bit. The challenges you start to face as engineers uh, shift a little bit. And so uh, we'll talk about some of those and how we're facing them at NerdWallet. So I want to talk with a, a little bit about me first, because I think my journey to get here is interesting, and GraphQL is something that I think when most people meet me, they don't think about. Um, so I started out my career doing telecom operations. Uh, how many people in the audience know what UUNet is or remember what UUNet is? Yeah, all right. Did you? All right, when? 2001? Cool. So I joined, uh, I joined UUNet in 2000, in April of 2000. This map was produced in June of 2000. Uh, if you don't remember UUNet, you probably remember WorldCom. They screwed up like Enron and did a whole big accounting scandal thing. Uh, WorldCom bought UUNet uh, in about, I don't know, I think it was like August of 2000, somewhere around there. Um, but back then, back in 2000, UUNet was like the internet. If you were online and you were doing anything outside of like a little regional ISP, you were pretty much transiting on UUNet's backbone. Uh, like I said, this is a map of their backbone. Um, fun fact, back then, uh, the biggest backbone pipes operated at about 10 gigabits a second. Uh, most of them were two and a half gigabits a second. Today, 400 gigabits a second is like pretty much the floor. Uh, and Google is like laying fiber for like multi terabit a second pipes right now, which is pretty interesting and pretty cool. Um, from telecom operations, I moved into uh, fully managed services, running Unix systems, Solaris, AIX, things like that. Uh, and I started to focus my career on building software and specifically building software for operations. Um, over the past decade, pretty much everything that's you know, modern business is either building or operating software. Uh, and I've really found this really interesting niche where I really try to focus on helping engineering teams work together to get the most out of building and operating software. Uh, my current title here at NerdWallet is DevOps. Uh, along the way, I've held titles like sysadmin, operations lead, site reliability engineer, and a bunch of other things. Uh, I needed to throw a Rick meme in here because who doesn't love a good surly Rick meme? Um, along the way, I've learned that pretty much software is mostly opinion, especially when you get into a large group of people. There's no right or wrong way to build anything. It's all about how you work together as a team. Uh, and you know, humans are funny people. We work together in very different ways. You could put two different groups of people together and ask them to build the same thing and you'd get wildly different things. So this is a React, React meetup. And so what does this all have to do with React at the end of the day? Well, as Stuart mentioned, we build a lot of React apps at NerdWallet, like a lot of React apps. Um, and most of the time, the challenges that we face don't have anything to do with building components or shipping those components or running the node services. The challenges we face really are, how do the front end teams and the back end teams work together to get to a place where we're actually solving the product problems that we're trying to solve? It's the, the intersection of front end and back end, as it were. You know, I hear a lot of things from back end engineers like, I don't know what done is, right? Uh, every couple of weeks, the front end keeps coming back and they want me to like cherry pick some more data or they want me to drive some more data for them. You know, I have this nice generic CRUD API. I gave you an SDK, like just go and build what you need to build on top of that. And then front-end engineers conversely say things like, why, why are there no docs for this, right? Like, how do I explore this API? This thing is so hard to use. I have all this custom logic in my state layer to deal with your weird generic CRUD API on the back end. The intersection causes a lot of tension when you put humans involved in there because there's no explicit boundary. There's no right way to do it. Sometimes we solve those problems in the front end in the state layer, and sometimes we solve those problems in the back end. The topic of this tension is nothing new. And if you actually go looking around on the internet, you find all kinds of memes about it. Things like this, 
which I also like to say is what people who don't have kids think being a parent is like versus what people who have kids know being a parent is really like. Or this, uh, fun fact around this, <laughs> one, of my, uh, one of my favorite projects I have ever worked on uh, was back in 2010, I hacked an electronic knitting machine for a conference that was about art and technology and we live knitted tweets from Twitter over the course of a day, it was kind of fun. The code's on GitHub if you wanna go see it. Uh, this is, I think, my favorite picture, mostly because it's all nice and pretty. Um, but you know, before we go any further, uh, I actually want to define, you know, what's front end and back end, and what is front end and back end in the rest of the context of this talk. So for me, a front end is any piece of software that a user is directly interacting with, and it could be anything. It could be a web app in a browser. It could be an app on a mobile phone, a native app. Uh, it could be something like a voice app running on an Alexa or in a Dot or something like that. It could even be an Eve app running in a Tesla, one of those new fancy smart cars. Conversely, uh, a backend is something that you have indirect interactions with. It typically speaks protocols like HTTP or RBC or all kinds of other things in between there. Um, some differing things, backends typically have longevity, while frontends are typically going through much more rapid development cycles. This isn't always the case, but as a generality is, you know, it's because things like operating system internals and algorithms and data structures, they don't change as much as things like product and experience and things like that change. One of the big challenges that we see when we're rolling out products, and I mentioned this before, is that front end teams often need the data they're getting from back ends massaged and changed over time as the product starts to evolve. And as we go from an idea to something that we can start to experiment and collect data on, and then as we actually evolve through there. Uh, you know, it ends up doing things where like the mobile, uh, the front end team starts out with, oh, I make this one request and I get the data. But by the time I ship the product, I'm making like five or six requests to the back end just to get the data that I need. Uh, with mobile, it gets really interesting. Like our mobile app is somewhere between like, I think like 15 requests just to get started, just to load, just to get all of the data. You start putting like wireless networks in there and all of a sudden it gets, you know, a little bit bad. So uh, this is a talk about GraphQL, obviously. We are at a GraphQL React meetup. Um, GraphQL, if you don't know, is a, it's an open source uh, specification. It's not a piece of software. Uh, it's a data query and manipulation language for APIs. Um, how many people here are currently using GraphQL today? All right, so like about a quarter, we'll call it somewhere around a quarter. So I have a friend who works at Zero. He's sitting right here, his name's Adam. Uh, Adam has been singing the praises of GraphQL to me since about 2017. There was a period where we were hanging out and that's all we used to talk about at the beginning. Uh, you know, to talk about things about how gra great GraphQL was for them as they were rolling out new products. Interestingly, around the same time, our mobile team here was starting to explore how they could start to solve some of their problems. And we were starting to explore whether or not we could build something to deal with that so that we can make the mobile app not have to make 15 round trips to get started up and not have to deal with smashing up data on themselves. I think the interesting thing for me about GraphQL is it's a really good example of the build versus buy discussion that is like a continual thing that you deal with when you're doing software engineering things. Uh, I believe that if we had decided to fund an internal project to build an API layer for mobile specifically, we probably would have done a pretty good job. It probably would have solved the needs that we had right away. Uh, and, you know, probably would have been something that would have been really bespoke and a few people would have known about and would have been hard to contribute to. I think for me specifically, though, the, the value of GraphQL, especially to an organization like NerdWallet, is not just in that core, you know, schema and query system. It's in the rest of the ecosystem. There's developer tooling, there's pre-built operations tools and services out there. And there's collective learnings that allow us to focus our energy on what actually matters for NerdWallet. We can focus more on moving that value, uh, the needle, sorry, on our value prop for our mission and our vision in our company as opposed to building this low-level technology that nobody ever really actually sees about. So we began adopting GraphQL here at NerdWallet in the second half of 2018. Uh, I provided a bunch of thought leadership around how it might fit into our stack and our strategy. And I did the initial prototype of how we would actually roll uh, GraphQL out in our node build system and our, the rest of our CI pipeline for it. Uh, I like to think of GraphQL uh, in the spirit of this talk as the back end for front ends here. Uh, and I think it's gonna solve a lot of the challenges that, we're gonna, that we are currently facing and will continue to face as we continue to build uh, more front ends on our back ends. Um, so in December of 2018, I gave an internal tech talk to try to introduce GraphQL to the rest of the engineering crew here. It was called, What the Fuck is GraphQL? Uh, it was pretty well received, and so I got asked to do a derivative of it here tonight. So that's what this is. So I wanna do a little brief history of GraphQL for those that have no idea about it, and even for those that are using it but might not actually know why it came to be. Um, I wanna do it because the point that I wanna illustrate here is that 
GraphQL wasn't some like overarching thing that Facebook set out and they were like, we're gonna build this. This is something that you know, we wanna do and we're gonna open source it and we're gonna get a lot of cred from it. It was really actually a group of people inside of Facebook solving problems that they were facing like for real as they were building products. And it happened iteratively over the course of a number of different years before they arrived at what was GraphQL. Um, I'm totally ripping all this part off. So if you are familiar with GraphQL, Lee and Dan are probably names that you know. Uh, if you're not, I actually, uh, and you're interested to go deeper, I suggest you go check these things out. Lee's talk, Four Years of GraphQL specifically, is a really good crash course. It's an hour long and it goes like way deep into all of the actual problems that they were solving. Uh, I also want to do a shout out to somebody named Nick Schrock, who's a back-end engineer. It doesn't, his name doesn't come up as much, but he was actually the one who did the original very first prototype uh, of graph of the, what, what they were doing at Facebook at the time, they called it Super Graph at the time. So. so let's go all the way back to 2011. How many people remember 2011? I, yeah, I, iPhone 4 was the hot new device that was going on, and Facebook was shipping HTML fragments out of a monolith PHP application into this like native wrapper. So in the views here, the only thing that's native is like the title bar, the search box, and the thing at the bottom. Everything else here is just little HTML snippets coming out of a PHP app on the back end. In 2012, Facebook decided, you know what, we're gonna do it. We're gonna build native everything. We're gonna stop shipping HTML. We're gonna actually build a full native app. Uh, and they were gonna use FQL, which is what their API was at the time. How many people remember FQL? Ooh, yeah, it was a, it was a rough API to work with back then. Um, internally, though, there was a team called Product Infrastructure. That's where uh, Nick and Dan were from. Uh, and they were working on something that was dealing with data loading and privacy checking. And they theorized that what they were working on could actually be exposed publicly, and it's what ended up becoming GraphQL. It's the query language that became it. Uh, and they ended up convincing everybody, and they launched the newsfeed into production in August, and then a bunch of things followed. Uh, from 2013 to 2015, a bunch of stuff happened. They officially formed a team inside. I don't think it was called the GraphQL team at the time. They officially formed a team around this technology. And they started working on a lot of the different problems that they were trying to solve. And so they think about it in three different phases, scaling models, scaling views, and scaling updates. And what that meant was uh, scaling models was when this first started to take off, they were like, this, this is good. This fits. It feels right. We're solving problems. We're actually you know, starting to use this and make our lives easier. But they started to get to this place where their type system started to get big and verbose, and the query started to get really big and really verbose, and it result resulted in something called fragments. Allowed them to take it and say, oh, you know, we're gonna use this little section of our, uh, of our query or this section of our schema over and over again, so we don't have to keep copy and pasting this everywhere. Uh, it was built into the client layer at first, so the client expanded everything that was a fragment and still sent the full query to the server. And later on, once they realized they had a good fit, they changed it so that it was all server-side and you could send the fragment along with the query. The server would do the expansion. And then they faced on scaling views, and so this is where mutations came from. So mutations, if you don't know GraphQL, is what their write path is. GraphQL has a very explicit separation of read paths and write paths. And so when they first launched GraphQL, it was read only. And what that meant is that meant that if they needed to write something, they used the general REST endpoint and they would post. Then they'd have to follow up with a second GraphQL query to refresh the view with the new data that they made. And so mutations came out as the way for them to do an explicit write, but they'd get the read after write as well. So they'd send their write and what would come back from it was what they actually wanted. And it was nice because you could actually say, oh, I want to do this write and here's the query that I want to come back from it. It allowed them to scale their views out. Same thing, it was client side first, they made it fit and then they moved it to the server. And then the last thing was scaling updates. And so like so many things back then and so many things still today, everything was live poll originally, where they would just sit there and hit that endpoint over and over and over and over again with the query. Eventually they ended up launching subscriptions. Along the way, a whole bunch of other stuff like uh, code generation and persistent queries and graphical and relay and a lot of these tools now. Uh, we know came to be. And then finally in 2015, uh, they did their first technical preview in the middle of the summer and open sourced it towards the end of the summer. Uh, so 2016 to now, uh, everybody's adopting it. Uh, I recently read on Twitter that Twitter is also about to launch their GraphQL endpoint, um, which is kind of cool. I think they're gonna be like the next biggest thing besides Facebook that's running GraphQL. Uh, social proof exists that it's actually solving real problems around there. Uh, there's clients and servers for so many things. You can get a Haskell client if anybody's still actually building from Haskell these days, which is kind of cool. But the thing that I wanna call out that I think is the most important thing that happened uh, was the relicensing. So, uh, back then, Facebook was using a modified uh, BSD license that had a patent clause that they added to it. And somebody realized, a lawyer realized that the way that they had licensed GraphQL, GraphQL wasn't software, it was a specification. The way they had licensed GraphQL actually meant that Facebook owned any implementation of the specification at that point in time. And as a lawyer, he called out, this is why. Uh, 
The team in under 30 days got Facebook internally to relicense the whole thing under the Open Web Foundation, which I think is like super admirable. That's like super fast turnaround for a big company like Facebook. And I think it shows that these were real people that were like, you know, passionate about what they were working on. This wasn't some big company that was like, oh no, we're gonna try to own all of this stuff. I think it was a, a really good thing for them to do. So now that we've covered a little bit of GraphQL, I wanna give you a little bit of a history of NerdWallet so that we can sort of set the stage for where GraphQL is gonna play here. So if we go back to 2016 for us, NerdWallet looked a little bit like this. This is a simplified thing. We had some more middleware in between. Uh, we have a very large WordPress installation that powers all of our content, uh, but we're gonna leave that out for simplicity's sake. And so we have a logged in web experience that we were working on and a bunch of little JavaScript apps. We have a big system for our identity for all of our auth on our profile, event logging, some financial product APIs, uh, AB system and feature flagging system and things like that. Everything's pretty tightly coupled. We have this like really direct link between our products and the, uh, the interfaces on the back end and there's a couple lines going everywhere. When we get to 2017, uh, NerdWallet officially kicked off our membership phase. So this is the mobile app started to happen and we started to build out more and more things to support that. Uh, you can see that our service tier starts to expand. We have more things and I have, apparently have a typo. I can't spell bills and somebody pointed that out and I didn't fix it. Um, and a bunch more services come in. We started to build a feed. We started to jam some things into our identity system. And the line started to get more and more complicated. More and more round trips needed to get made from the web experience and the mobile app to all of our different mid-tier and back-end systems. In 2018, the membership thing, the train was really rolling now. More and more systems start to get built. We have more front-end apps being built. Uh, the identity side, so all of our profile and information power, uh, powering our membership experience starts to get bigger. The lines start to get bigger. There are more and more calls going back and forth between the front end and the back end. We start to shatter out some of our services, which means more and more calls now. You used to be able to just call the identity system, but now you have to call the identity system and the feed system and the user data system and all these other things to get the data that we needed to build our products. So we get to 2019, we get to now, we get to where we are and where we're going in the future. And this is, a, this is an optimistic thing. We're, we're not fully in production with GraphQL right now, but this is where we feel that we want to be. This is where we think that we'll end up being the place that will let us really start to build for the product uh, experiences that we want to build in the future. And the idea really is that everything now just talks to GraphQL and GraphQL deals with all the span out underneath to all of our different services as we continue to shatter out more and more of our identity monolith and we start to build more and more backend services. So let's talk about the strategy of how we're using GraphQL and a little bit and where we're going with it and what we've bet on. So um, we picked Apollo. If you don't know, Apollo is probably the largest well-known implementation of a GraphQL server. Uh, it's fully open source. They got lots of good support for the client and the server side of things. Um, they also have a paid offering that we're uh, gonna take advantage of. This is an image from one of the blog posts that they took, uh, that they wrote, sorry. Uh, it's called Layering GraphQL on Top of REST. And the reason that I picked it is that you know, GraphQL is just a, for the way you implement Apollo, it's just a node service and you can do anything you want with it. If you wanted to have it go and talk to all your databases or have it pull from a cache directly, you can do that. But we've actually specifically picked our strategy to say, it's not gonna do that. It's only gonna pass through to the REST services underneath. We don't want our backend teams to have to change the way that they work at all. We want our backend teams to continue to work the way that they've been working up until this point in time. When, that way we don't also force migrations at any point in time. Some clients can continue to talk to the old backend services and we can start to pick what we want to migrate into the, uh, into the GraphQL layer. And by doing this, we get to leverage a lot of the technology that already exists in our service stack without having to really rebuild anything. So for instance, all of our access control and identity control system and the way we do roles and permissioning and things like that doesn't need to change. The client just simply passes the access tokens into the GraphQL layer. It continues to pass the access token through to the backend services it keeps to uh, over rest and off we go and everything continues to stay exactly the same as it was before. It means that we don't need to spend a lot of time rethinking about our back end strategy and we can instead focus on how we're going to improve our front end strategy with GraphQL. So I want to talk about some interesting things about uh, GraphQL that it does from an operations standpoint. So imagine um, Imagine we're, we have a system where we're gonna deal with projects and tasks and users and things like that. So this is a little illustration of what uh, REST queries would look like versus GraphQL queries. And the interesting thing about GraphQL is instead of thinking about APIs like a bunch of REST endpoints where you have, this is the entity, it's got an ID, I make this call, if I do a get to it, I get it back, if I post to it, I create it, or if I post to it, I update it, if I put to it, I create it, et cetera. Uh, you can now just post once to GraphQL. Now, if we go, it makes building client applications super intuitive because it means that we can design our queries to fetch the exact data that we need to make them congruent with the interfaces that we're ending up building. 
But there's an interesting operations aspect to this, and it's, I think it's pretty well highlighted here. You know, in the old world, if we wanted to get a user, find their projects, get a list of the projects for each project, get the tasks for each task, get the user assigned to those tasks, it's a lot of REST queries that have to go back and forth to it. But conversely, with GraphQL, it's now one query, and the developer doesn't necessarily need to think about the fan out that's happening underneath, which means that we end up in this world where somebody can either invert, uh, inadvertently or on purpose have this huge fan out effect over our network. Could be negative, might not be, but it's just one of those things that you need to start thinking about. And as an operations person, it's something that I think about. Part of the Apollo service offering that's super attractive to us is we have an operations registry that allows you to implement something called demand control. So that means that in our staging environment, where we want our developers to be able to use the, the graphical client or relay or any of the other clients that exist and just freely explore, they can go and do it. But by the time that we ship into production, we can say, no, these services can only make these queries. Once we figure out what the query is and the shape of the data, we can lock it in so that if somebody comes along and tries to explore our API, they don't necessarily need to, we don't need to worry about the fan out effect that they're gonna have on it. Here's a little picture sort of, of logically how we start to think about the components within GraphQL and Apollo, where front end and back end is, and then the dotted line is a hypothetical intersection between the two of them. Um, in GraphQL, when you start to define a type in your, uh, in your schema system, you define resolvers, and that says to GraphQL, for these fields, this is how I go and get the data. Apollo abstracts that a little bit further through data sources. Uh, one of the data sources that they ship is the REST data source. Uh, it's part of what makes their, their, uh, their offering so appealing. Uh, and for us, the nice thing about it is it means that we can build on top of that. We can build standard things, and it means that the back-end engineers can now own the data sources or focus all of their effort on how the data sources work. They can do a little bit of work on the back-end of the schema, and then the front-end engineers can come along and they can build on top of that. They can do things like impose new types that they want out of it or use fragments or whatnot to lift up the different pieces that they have, and it becomes this really nice collaborative, really well-defined handoff point for them. Uh, I mentioned about the data source. So this is, uh, this is what we've started to build on top of. So on top of the REST data source, we have our end up REST data source. And it means, that, it means that for building things, we can come up with super simple interfaces for it. So this is the interface for our feature flagging API. Pretty straightforward. It's got a constructor. Uh, it's got a way to get all of the feature flags for that. And we can make the call with the timeout. The nice thing here is that in our end up REST data source, we get to take care of all the common things. So things like authentication, uh, things like service identification, uh, error handling, timeout handling, all of that stuff, we can build once into our data source and then just build on top of that so we don't need to think about it anymore. So it makes building our data sources really straightforward. And then to go along with that, it means that we can now have these really nice straightforward schemas that go with it. So here's the schema that goes with that data source for our feature flags. The feature flag service is admittedly a very simple thing. And so it has a very simple schema that goes with it. Our feature flags have a name, a value. We let engineers ship extra data with them that's JSON that they can use for whatever they want. We extend our query type with a way for you to get feature flags for all of the current user, uh, sorry, for the current app that you are, and it returns a set of feature flags. So this is one of the first things that we actually shipped into our, uh, into our GraphQL layer and into our mobile app. This happened back at the end of 2018. Uh, we shipped out um, AB and feature flags, uh, and they were gated behind a feature flag, which is kind of meta and ironic about all of it. But we didn't start thinking about this. When we actually started to do our very first prototyping of GraphQL, we didn't start with feature flags. We actually started to think about, well, what's our product about? Our product's all about financial products and financial services. So maybe we should look at doing something like that. And we actually started trying to do some of our marketplace data. Um, so given that our marketplace data is, this is what we've ended up with the data source for, and it's pretty straightforward. Um, but conversely, the schema is massive for it. It's like totally huge. Uh, here's about half of what our current schema for one vertical in the marketplace looks like. So it's like 200 lines of actual schema, and I couldn't even put them all on the slide. I just gave up on doing it. Uh, the PR to implement all of this that was actually just merged recently reflects all of it. So, I mean, if you look, like 167 comments on this PR, six different engineers were commenting on it and going through all of it. It included engineers from our mobile team, included engineers from our back-end services team, included engineers from some of the mid-tier uh, mid services team. 32 total commits across it, 1,800 lines of code, including some of the mocks and some of the sample data that we have. And the takeaway here is that trying to start with big things if you're going to experiment with GraphQL is a way to shoot yourself in the foot really badly, as we learned early on. You actually really need to start with something small because there's, you know, like we arrived at things like this 
only through experimenting and playing. And doing that experimentation and that playing with our feature flag and AV service that are really simple data models and really simple services on the back end actually allowed us to figure a lot of how we actually want to build all of this stuff into our standard tooling and service stack. So where are we at today? What is our current status with GraphQL after all of that? So our mobile apps have been using GraphQL since the beginning of Q1. Uh, the read pass that we do through it is we load A-B tests and feature flags through it. Uh, the first real product use case that we shipped was this. So this is, uh, in our mobile app, we have a, a spending module that lets you categorize your transactions and then track how you're spending your money. And so as we started to get into, well, what's something that's kind of really nice narrow scope for us to prototype and for us to go in and start to figure out what our first write path would be, and this is it. And so this was, we built a mutation for recategorizing the transaction. Back at the beginning, I talked about how mutations are nice because it's the write followed by the read. So this is great, this is great. We're gonna take our transaction ID, we're gonna take the category that we wanna change it to, we're gonna send that query, and then we're gonna get back the transaction again with its ID and the category and the merchant ID for it. Uh, we've also been prototyping in our standard web stack. So uh, there's a lot of different things. You know, we have a very mature React stack here. Uh, we use Redux for a lot of state store. Uh, the Apollo service offering has something called Apollo, uh, is it Apollo Link State or is that the mobile one? It's got, it's got a, something that deals with its own state, so you don't need to worry about managing your queries through that. And trying to figure out how to work all of that into our standard uh, tooling has been a very interesting challenge along the way. So this is, we have a, we have a, our, we have an engineering blog that's currently powered entirely by our, uh, our WordPress uh, front end. Uh, we've decided that we'd power, we try to build a client to pull data from our WordPress API and redisplay it as a new front end for the blog. So this is publicly up. Uh, it's not indexed anywhere. You can't find it anywhere. You have to know a direct slug and then go look at it. But it was a really good way for us to go through and figure out how we're going to do it. There's a bunch of other internal tooling components and all kinds of other stuff that we got stuck through our regular stack that we needed to figure out how we were going to now make work with GraphQL and let us build things like resolvers and REST clients for our, uh, for our WordPress backend as well. So to close this all out, um, you know, even though we have common API tooling for building our backend services, I mentioned at the beginning that if we took the same service and said, look, here's a service design, and then gave that to two different teams and asked them to build it, we come back with two wildly different services on the back end, which for front end people is terrible because you never know exactly how the back end is going to work because the human element makes it a little bit different. And so GraphQL is really nice because it gives us this really consistent handoff that's explicit. It means that we have one place to do schema code review so that we can apply things like style guides and ventures and stuff like that to our schema so that from a front end perspective, casing, the way we name things, all kinds of stuff like that can be consistently applied everywhere and we don't need to worry about how all the different back ends work. We can go and use our data sources and our resolvers to deal with mashing up all of those little differences. Now this is gonna let us do things like have really like step function efficiency gains on the front end side of things because people don't need to worry about that anymore. At uh, the start of the talk, I told you I was going to cover two different things. And the first one was that you'd have a better understanding of why GraphQL was created and the problem it addressed. And the number two was practical examples of the challenges that you'll face if you do start to implement GraphQL. Uh, I hope you've taken these things away, and I hope you've taken a little bit more away from this as well. Uh, NerdWallet, we really believe that GraphQL is going to be a really solid foundation for us to build on in the future. And it's going to do lots and lots of really good things for both the front end and the back end. Thank you all. That was awesome. Very informative. Packed. Um, does anyone have any questions? We have these two microphones set up along both sides of the audience that you can line up at. We're going to take three questions. So if anyone has any questions, and we'll, we'll repeat this process for the next couple of talks as well. Um, you'll press the button. Um, hello. <clears throat> so do you guys use uh, Gatsby at all? And does Gatsby have a place with Apollo? Or they... uh, I don't know what Gatsby is, so I don't think so. Yeah. Does anyone know what Gatsby is? <laughs> okay. All right. Well. Um, so you mentioned uh, fan out being a problem. Um, so uh, are you applying to like uh, make sure that all of the queries that you uh, actually ship and that you uh, allow to be um, performed are not uh, pathologically fanning out or? Right. And that's exactly what that operations registry is. So that way what we can do is we can say, this is the query, we're gonna pre-vet it from both an operations and an engineering side, and then we're gonna ship it so that you can't change the query at all, so that we have a good idea ahead of what the fan out is. 
And so just to call out, because I think something that's really interesting is one of the things that GraphQL really solves is that n plus one problem where before you had to make n queries to get all the different things and now you could pathologically write something that you had projects with users and tasks that had projects and users and tasks and continually rehearse down, yeah. And you think you're going to go look into all of the uh, um, packages to uh, manage the complexity for you, so all of the automatic uh, complexity packages. Right, but forgot to wear a card. <laughs> Uh, do you have any stats on the performance gain with GraphQL before and after? Or, or? Uh, like you mean like actual query performance and things like that? Yeah, with the wire. No, not, nothing so far. I mean, we haven't gone very far with it in production. Like I said, the only real use cases we have are AB feature flags and then that category recategor or transaction recategorization. So we haven't really been like done anything where, you know, I believe once we get to a place that we don't have 15 requests to load our mobile app, You'll see, like, you know, you'll see something where it's like two or three seconds to start up now going down to sub seconds to start up and things like that, but nothing actually measurable right now to share now. Thanks. Oh. Hi. Um, so, in the pictures you showed with the various Neared Wallet systems, you kind of had the before and then you introduced the Apollo as a sort of, let's call it a middleware or a, an intermediary service there. Uh, what are some of the advantages or trade offs of? using Apollo or GraphQL. Uh, yes, the pink box there, yes. right? So I, I, I was thinking as you got to that slide that having that pink box there is great. Yep. You could achieve that probably with a lot of different styles of servers and you could massage the data there. Totally. That's, so, that's, so why GraphQL and what, what advantages and trade-offs? Yeah, and I, I probably was talking really fast for that slide. So the, like I said, I believe that if we went back to 2017, 2018, when we were talking about building our own layer to solve some of mobile's problems that we were facing at the time, we probably could have done a great job rolling out a simple service that spoke REST still, but was specifically tuned for what mobile was facing from a problem standpoint. Uh, the thing that I think is the big win that we get out of this is that it means that there's a lot of different things like the Apollo offering that means that from you know my view as an operations person, I don't have to build anything that like the demand control and the access registry and the monitoring and the fact that we can see things like, oh, you're going to make this schema change and I can see all of the queries that are going to be impacted by that is a hugely big thing for me because we don't have to build that. We can spend our energy instead building for the different things. I think conversely, the con to it though is that you know, if we had built something bespoke, we have a bunch of knowledge tribally about how our services work and how we run services. So it means that other developers, you know, getting ramped up on GraphQL is not a little task at all. Like if you've never touched it before and I ask you to come and change the schema, it's a very daunting thing, especially in a system where we already have found some of what our opinion and our style is gonna be. And so the con is now it means that anybody coming into it who hasn't touched GraphQL has a much bigger ramp up period before they could come in and actually contribute to it. Thank you for reiterating that. Thank you. Okay, everyone give it up for Evan. That was awesome.